Well, welcome. We are uh, going to be looking at uh, the topic of the great rebel, the great rebel. But again, before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your goodness to us. And we are grateful that in the crazy times in which we live, you saw it beforehand, and you have given us a record, a prophetic record of what would come. And in looking at that prophetic record, we can be confident that you love us, that you are in control, and that though the chaos may be continuing, and it may be quite uh, profound, uh, yet we can know that you are with us and that you have a plan to pull us through. And so as we study your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide and to work out your perfect will and way in our lives. This evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so just as a review from last week, we were looking at the Great Revolution, and that the Great Revolution is an attack on God and his law, by Satan. Of course, Saint, Satan has his croonies as well, not just him, but he's the, the coordinator of it. And uh, of course, we looked at a number of accusations that he made about God's law. And in response to that, we see that it's clear from scripture that God's law is a law of liberty. It's a law of freedom, not a bondage. That his law can be kept. We see that in the life of Christ. And he offers us his strength, his power, so that we can keep God's law, that God's law was not nailed to the cross, but the ceremonial law, the handwriting written against us by Moses was nailed to the cross, and that all of God's laws must be kept, not just part of uh, them, not just one here and one there, or many there and minus one here, and that God in his love and his mercy, the new covenant relationship is that he will write his law in our minds and in our hearts. Not that we are going to uh, be freed from the law. We will be freed from the condemnation of the law, but the law still exists. And again, the law is uh, law's basis of a government and God's government is going to last forever. So his law is going to last forever as well. Now we are going to turn our vision over to Daniel chapter 7. So this is where we're going to sit uh, for this evening. Um, and uh, so you can turn there in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. This is going, we're going to be here mostly. We'll be going to various different other places, but this will be the uh, go-to spot for this evening. And uh, we are not going to get through all of Daniel 7 tonight. Uh, we'll only get through part of it, and we'll have to continue after that. Uh, but some encouraging things that we can find here, stuff that we can learn uh, about uh, the Lord and what he is doing and what he is in charge of. And so we're going to go ahead and get into it. And uh, so we'll need some eager beavers to uh, to go ahead and read. So we're looking now at Daniel chapter seven and verses one through three. Daniel seven verses one through three. Who would like to read that? I don't have a huge amount to choose from. So if you don't jump on quick, I'm gonna read. All right, Penny. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sums of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven's drove upon the great sea and the four great beasts came up from the sea diverse one from another okay all right so you know very clearly there is um 
there is the uh, Babylon, you have Daniel who is, uh, you know, who is here. He has a dream. Apparently it's at night while he's sleeping. And it's during the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So how does Belshazzar fit into the whole pattern? Well, Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was reigning as the primary king of Babylon when it becomes a world power. Uh, and then he had a son and a grandson. And Belshazzar is the grandson. Both the son and the grandson were, were joint rulers of Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar was off the scene. And uh, it appears uh, from historical records and from Daniel's account that Belshazzar uh, predominantly stayed home at Babylon and took care of uh, government and issues and so on there at the, the center capital. And the father was in charge of uh, taking the armies off and defeating and fighting against uh, marauders and other things of that nature. And so we don't usually hear, in fact, in the biblical history, we don't hear of Belshazzar's father at all. We just hear of Belshazzar. And of course, Belshazzar was the one that was uh, king of Babylon when Babylon fell, and he was the one where they had the party and the drunken party with a thousand of his lords and so on. And then there was that bloodless hand that wrote on the wall, many, many tekel ufarsin, and, um, and so on. We did not cover that story, but that's in Daniel chapter five, if you wanna refer back to that. So it's in this time of Belshazzar's reign. So we are a number of years along the line. Daniel is no longer a young man like he was when he was interpreting, uh, when he was interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And here, instead of being the interpreter of a dream, now Daniel is the one having the dream. And so he receives this vision directly from God while he is in his, uh, while he's in his sleep. Now, when it comes to prophecy, uh, we are told a few things about prophecy. So keep your finger here in Daniel chapter seven, because we're going to be coming back to it. But let's go over to Second Peter one and verses twenty and twenty-one. Second Peter one and verses twenty and twenty-one. Uh, and uh, again, towards the end of the Bible there. All right, Ricardo, go ahead. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All right. So, so prophecy is not a private interpretation. Uh, meaning that it's not just in the mind of a, of a single individual here or, or there. Now, of course, there, there is usually somebody that's ahead of the game and that is studying and the Lord and, you know, and so on. But it, it's, it's where you come together and you study together and you seek to understand the word. And the Bible becomes its own interpreter. When we look at things, we, we see that terms and phrases are uh, interpreted by the Bible itself. And so there are a number of phrases that are used in this uh, introduction to uh, this vision in Jan Daniel chapter 7. And it uh, begins really in verse 3, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 3. It says, there are four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. And before that, in verse 2, it says there were four winds that strove on the great sea. So let's look at winds. What do winds represent? So let's go to Jeremiah. So keep your finger there in Daniel chapter seven. We're gonna to go to Jeremiah uh, chapter 49 and verses 35 to 37. Jeremiah 49 and verses 35 to 37. And uh, when somebody gets it, you can unmute and read. All right, Maria. All right, uh, Maria, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. All right, Ricardo, go ahead. Thus said the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam 
the chief of their might. And upon Elam will I bring four winds from the four quarters of heaven and will scatter them towards all the, those winds. And there shall be no nation without the outcast of Elam shall not, over, um, shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, said the Lord. And I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. All right. So we use the word winds in 36. And then uh, it talks, it goes on to describe what those winds are going to be. Those winds are going to be enemies. The, those winds are going to bring bringing the evil upon them. It's going to bring the sword and so on. Uh, and, uh, and so we're looking at strife that is happening here. Uh, between nations, between kingdoms, be between uh, armies, and so on. If we go to Jeremiah 51, 1, so that's just uh, two chapters over. Jeremiah 51 and verse 1, we see the same uh, issue. Yes, Penny, you're right. Wars and judgments of God. All right, so uh, Isaiah 51 and verse 1, who would like to read that? All right, I got Maria again. but I can't hear you. So that's interesting. So that's having the same thing with Jared. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Uh, Penny, go ahead. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will rise up against Babylon and against them who dwell in the midst of them who rise up against me, a destroying wind. Mm -hmm. So it's a destroying wind, and it's going to rise up against Babylon. Okay, so that's Isn't interesting. Isn't that the Medes and the Persians? That's right. Yes, it was going to be the Medes and the Persians who, who came to take over, over Babylon. Uh, we also find winds in Revelation. So going to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, and of course, Revelation, uh, basically, Revelation covers every prophecy of Daniel. It reiterates it in a different way, uh, and then includes some uh, additional information, of course, as well. So Revelation 7 and verse 1, and uh, I'll go ahead and read this one. It says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So if you have four angels holding four winds, uh, and uh, the winds are um, strife, bloodshed, wars, judgments of God, and so on, then if you have the four angels holding the four winds, then it's holding back that strife. It's the restraining hand of God, keeping that from going forward, uh, in an unrestricted manner. And uh, here in verse, uh, yeah, chapter seven, Revelation chapter seven and verse one, it says that I, that they held the winds, four winds from the earth, that it should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So that brings us to the next point, because in Daniel chapter, uh, chapter seven and uh, verse two, it says that in the vision of the night, behold, four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. So what does the great sea represent? Well, we have that answer right here in Revelation, and it's Revelation 17 and verse 15. Revelation 17 and verse 15. Again, the Bible interprets itself. So let's look there, Revelation 17 and verse 15. And what does that say? Who would like to read it? And again, to read, you just unmute yourself. And there's a couple of you, your microphones aren't working. So sorry about that. Or at least it's not coming through on our side. All right, Ricardo. And he said unto me, the water which thou sawest the whore sitteth are people and multitude and nation and tongues. Okay. So the waters or seas or oceans uh, here in prophetic language represents multitudes of people, many people. 
Uh, and so it can represent a nation, it can represent populations and so on. So in uh, Daniel chapter seven and verse three had a vision. There are four winds of the heaven that strove upon the great sea. All right, so there's, it's a, it's a vision of strife, of conflict, and it's going to involve populations or nations of people. That's what we're getting at here. And then we go on to verse three and verse three says, and four great beasts came up from the sea. All right, so coming up from the sea, if they're coming up from the sea, then are they coming from populated areas or unpopulated areas? Populated. All right. So populated areas, because they're coming from the sea. And sea represents peoples, nations, tongues, and so on. So they're coming from populated areas. And so you have four great beasts. What are beasts then? So if we go to Daniel chapter 7, we're going to go a little bit further down the chapter, and we're going to look at verses 17 and 23. Again, it is going to define for us what these things are. So in Daniel 7, verses 17 and 23, it says, and who would like to read that? All right, Portia. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Okay. So a beast represents a king or a kingdom because a king represents the kingdom which he is a king over. So in prophecy, beasts, anytime you see beasts, then we're talking about kingdoms. We're talking about nations. We're talking about sometimes it may refer to the head of that kingdom. Uh, but many times it refers to the whole network or the whole structure of that kingdom or that power. <clears throat> All right. And, uh, and so again, in verse two, we were looking at that and it says that the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. So again, we're talking about war among people and nations. And now we're talking about specific nations, specific kingdoms, four great beasts, four great kingdoms that come out, out of the sea, out of a populated area. And it says diverse one from another. So each of them are, have their own qualities. Each of them have their own characteristics that are different than the qualities or characteristics of the others. So let's go on, verse four. Who would like to read verse four? Look at the first beast. All right, uh, Violet. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> so the first is like a lion, but it has eagle's wings. So we have a lion with eagle's wings, but both the lion being the king of predators and the eagle being the king of uh, the uh, carnivorous birds and so on, the king of the air and the king of the land. <clears throat> so we have a kingly uh, representation here. And remember, what time was this? When was this vision given? Daniel had this vision when which power was in uh, ascendancy? Right. So it was, it was during um, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, but it was Babylon. So it was the kingdom of Babylon that was still in existence while Daniel was having this vision. And so the first nation that is being represented by these beasts is the very same one that was uh, decades ago 
when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream of the statue, which we looked at in Daniel chapter 2, and the head of gold represented Babylon. So it's that is you, O king. You were the head of gold. And that he was talking to Nebuchadnezzar. And Babylon, of course, is represented by the lion with the wings. And on Ishtar Gate, you have lions as part of that. There's some, uh, some artifacts from uh, Babylon that uh, show depictions of lions with wings as well. So it fits with the culture of the time. And then there's this interesting description, description here. So the wings were plucked off and it was lifted from the earth and made to stand upon the feet of a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So you have this ferocious beast and then you have a heart of a man that is given to it. So what is that referring to? Well, one of the things that it may be referring to is uh, a familiar story in Daniel. If we go back a few chapters to Gen Daniel chapter 4 and verses 30 to 34, we run into Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, we run into Nebuchadnezzar uh, in a very interesting way. So uh, Daniel chapter 4 and verses 30 to 34. Who would like to read that? All right. Hi, Marlon. How are you? I am fine. <laughs> Excellent. You want to read? Um, yes. Okay. Just let me just get this. Or were you making a comment? Uh, no, no. Okay. Well, it's mm -hmm. glad to have you with us. Yeah. <laughs> just a minute. Let me just find the text. Not a problem. Again, the context for this, you have Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who's king of Babylon. He's basically um, claiming everything as his own right. He's the one that has made this, and he has, uh, he has done all of these things, and now God's going to intervene. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Daniel 4, verses 30 to 34. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass, as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Mm. Yes, it's a very interesting description. Um, you know, <laughs> you have a man, and the man is turned into a beast. Um, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's humbled seven times. It talks about seven times that he was in that state. Now, uh, we'll look at it pretty soon that a time is, uh, is a day, essentially. And prophetically, a day is equal to a year. And so he's in this state for seven years. But, but notice the description of his hair. It didn't grow like man's hair. It grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's Claws. So here you have the, the eagle, right? Isn't that what we were seeing? Uh, Daniel uh, 7 and verse 4, right? He was given, uh, he was like a lion that had eagle's wings, and the wings were plucked off, was lifted up from the earth, made to stand on the feet of his man, and the man's heart was given to it. So 
So here you have Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter four, that he, you know, was a man and now he's got eagle's feathers and eagle's claws. But then when his, when after these seven years are over, his reason comes back to him. Well, then he doesn't remain, as far as we understand, he doesn't remain with all of these eagle's feathers and the eagle claws. As, as a beast in the field, he stands up again as a man and his reason comes back to him and he praises the God of heaven and so on. And I suspect that after this time of humbling, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reign was not so cruel like it had been previously. And so we see very clearly in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, the answer to this prophecy of which kingdom or which king this is in Daniel 7, chapter 4, it's Babylon. It's referring to Nebuchadnezzar and then Babylon as the nation of that or after um, that he represents. So then we go on to verse number five, Daniel seven and verse five. Who would like to read that? All right, Portia. And behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and it has three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they, and they said thus unto it, arise before much flesh. Mm -hmm. All right, so next beast means next king or next kingdom. And uh, this one is represented as a bear. Now, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a lion is big. And it's considered the, the king of predators, but it's actually not the biggest carnivore. The biggest carnivore is a bear. Um, you know, the brown Kodiak bears or the, um, the um, polar bears, right? Those are the largest bears that are, that are out there. And they're actually quite a bit bigger than lions. Of course, they don't live in the same territory. And so we don't know how they would interact with each other. And if one went after the other, who would win? But uh, in this case, of course, the bear took over the lion. And uh, the next nation that took over, as we understood from the uh, Daniel 2 uh, prophecy, is that it was Medo-Persia that took over Babylon. That was the, the chest and the arms of silver. And here's the bear. And uh, it's lifted up on one side meaning it was made of two, right? Just as you have the chest and arms of silver, you have two arms, a right arm, left arm, and usually people have a strong arm and a weaker arm. Same thing with the nation. You had two nations of Medo-Persia. You had the Medes and the Persians. Uh, the Medes came first, but the Persians were really the stronger, and so they were the, they were the stronger side, lifting up on one side, and then it had three ribs in its mouth. Well, what do those ribs represent? It represents uh, nations, that were destroyed in it coming to its ascendancy. And so you had Medo-Persia that uh, took over Lydia. You had Medo-Persia that took over Egypt and you had Medo-Persia that took over Babylon. Right? And, uh, and so you have those three kingdoms that are overtaken as it becomes then its world, uh, its world power and it is to devour much flesh. So we're going along the same lines as the, uh, the nations that were listed in the uh, image of Daniel chapter two. Now we're just seeing it from a different standpoint and we're seeing it in the context of beasts. And so of course, now you're going to go to the waste of bronze, which is now a leopard, Daniel seven and verse six. So let's look at Daniel seven and verse six. Who would like to read that? All right, Penny. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard, which had a 
upon the back of its four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads and dominion was given to it. All right, very good. And um, <clears throat> so here you have a very interesting beast. So it's like a leopard and it has four heads, but then it has four wings. Now the lion, of course, had two wings and uh, the wings also represent speed. And so Babylon quite quickly conquered uh, the then known world, but here you have a leopard that even more rapidly does so. And of course, the next beast along the lines goes right on with the next power in the, uh, the idol or the image that was shown. And that is Greece. Greece took over you know, Persia as the head empire. And Greece conquered the then known world very rapidly under Alexander the Great. Uh, his army of 40,000 men outmaneuvered and defeated the Medo-Persian army of 900,000. So that's a pretty big uh, spread there. You're talking over 20 to one. Uh, and, uh, and so his 40,000 men overcame 900,000 in the plain of Arbella. And that was in 331 BC. So that's when Greece became the world power. 331 BC, and Alexander marched his troops for three years without returning home. And he was conquering nation after nation in the then known world. And at last he came to the borders of India. So, you know, the whole East, Middle East and so on, he came all the way to India. And uh, there after that time, his, his troops refused to go any further. That was enough. And uh, at the age of 32, after hard round of drinking and suffering from malaria, uh, he eventually died. And after he died, so what's with the four heads? Well, after he died, his four generals then uh, took over the Greek empire and then ruled various different components or different, different parts of the empire. So you had Seleucus uh, who, uh, so you had the, the kingdom divided, uh, you had Ptolemy, right? So Ptolemy uh, ended up then uh, ruling the, the area down in Egypt, right? And kind of the Palestine area around in here. Uh, so that was Ptolemy's uh, um, area. Then you had Cassander and Cassander ruled up here more in the European uh, region, uh, more near where we, to understand Greece nowadays. You had Lysim uh, Lysimachus uh, and he ruled here in this middle region. And then you had Seleucus who then had the, actually the largest portion of the Greek empire that was here under which he ruled. And uh, they kind of, you know, have kind of north, south, east and west as far as that rule. And uh, so the beast had four heads and Greece continued to be a mighty world power, but never as mighty when it was just under Alexander the Great. And then, of course, now we have the next uh, power that's going to be coming up, and that's going to be looking at the dreadful or the terrible beast in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, Mariana. Yes. Um, Daniel 7, 7. Mm -hmm. um, and this is... And after this, I kept looking in the night's vision, and behold, a poor beast, dreadful and terrifying, and extremely strong, and he had large iron teeth. He devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had 10 horns. By the way, I just want to say that when you saw that, um, that on a map, uh, you said Greece. Yes, it is a Greece. But it also went all the way up, which is my homeland, Serbia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, today. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I've never been to Greece, but I've been to Serbia. I know you have. Mm -hmm. our, I'm going to go now in two weeks, um, and I will see Ines in the Alberto uh -huh. and do Very some good. welcome mission work. Yeah. Very good. I wish I could go back. Beautiful place and beautiful people. Yes, yeah, so we have a terrible beast. And 
every other beast, everything that that um, that Daniel has seen in vision so far, there's some correlation in nature that he could look at and he could say, or that he could call up and he could say, okay, it's like this, or it's like that, or it's like the other thing, whether or not it looked exactly like that, but it looked like it. And so he could approximate it to something else. Now he sees something that he has nothing in nature to equate this with. He has, he has nothing to say, okay, well, it's like a lizard or it's like a, you know, this or that or the other thing, all he can see is it's a terrible beast. And then he can, he describes a few features of this beast. It has huge iron teeth and it has these, it's, it's terrible. So it's frightening. And then it has these 10 horns, right? And of course the iron teeth, now we're looking at the same metal as is in the iron legs. And this is the next kingdom that's coming down. So uh, the Medes and the Persians gave way to Greece and Greece gave way to Rome, all right? So now we have Rome and we're looking at Rome. And, uh, and in uh, Daniel 2, and verse 40, when we look at the prophecy there in Daniel 2, it, uh, it says, I'll go ahead and read that. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Sounds like the very same description as, as uh, Daniel 7 and verse 7. It devoured, break in pieces, stamped the residue of the feet thereof. So it, it obviously represents the same power as Rome, that fourth kingdom. And it's the same one in, in here. So uh, all the beasts right, have different characteristics. This one is just so unique that uh, Daniel has to reiterate that, that it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Um, so, and then at these 10 horns. So let's, let's hone in on these 10 horns because that's something that we need to, we need to really, we need to look at, we need to understand. All right, so let's look at Daniel 7 and verse 24. This tells us a little bit more about these 10 horns. Daniel 7, 24. Who wants to read this one? Come on. All right, Portia. And the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall, that shall arise. And another shall, shall arise, diverse from the first, and he shall sub, subdue three kings. All right. So we have 10 horns. And, um, and so these are going to, um, and it says that the horns are kings, right? The kings. So, Horns also represent kings, just like beasts represent kings. Now, when you have a horn coming out of a beast, then you have a transition from one power to another power, or the horn might represent a king of that power, right? Um, and uh, so these are the kings, and these are kings that are going to end up coming out of Rome. And as we looked at before, when we looked at the 10 toes of the image, now we have the 10 horns. So everything again is correlating exactly with Daniel chapter two. And that, that's the Alemanni, Germany. Those are the Franks from France. Those are the Burgundians, which are the Swiss. You have the Suevi for Portugal. You have the Anglo-Saxons in Britain. You have the Visigoths from Spain, the Lombards in Italy. And then you had the Heruli, which were wiped out in 493, the Vandals, which were wiped out in 534, and the Ostrogoths that were destroyed in 538. So those three no longer exist. And that goes perfectly with the description of these horns, because three then are uprooted. Well, let's look at that one. And I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. Daniel chapter seven and verse eight. Who wants to read verse eight? Okay. 
Mm -hmm. All right, Merlin. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. All right. So we're so Daniel obviously is honing in on this horn, this king or kingdom or power. And, uh, and so that seems to be the object of this prophecy. So we had the, in Daniel chapter two, you've got the image. And of course, you've got the head of gold, which is Babylon. You have the arms and, and chest of silver, which is made of Persia. And then you have the, the, the thighs of, I mean, the, the waist or the thighs of brass. And then you have the legs of iron and then the feet of iron and clay with the 10 toes. But now... There's more detail that's given in this vision. And the, the greater detail now comes the little horn. So everything that we've seen so far is completely consistent with Daniel chapter two. Now it's a transition. We're going to transition into some additional details that we didn't see in Daniel chapter two. And the details really hover around this horn, this little horn. And, uh, and so we want to understand what this little horn is, because that's really the purpose of this vision in Daniel chapter 7, is understanding this horn and what's going on. So when we look at verse 25, it's going to give us some more details about this horn. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Who wants to read that? All right, Violet. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they and they shall be given unto his hands until the time and times and the dividing of time. Ah, oh, all right. So it's a small verse. Well, it's a medium-sized verse, but it is packed with information. Mm -hmm absolutely packed with information. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to tease out. And uh, there's information that we can look at to help us tease amongst these things, to understand what this little horn is. And there are seven characteristics of this little horn that we're going to look at. So in Daniel 7 and verse 8, it says, there came up among them another little horn. Well, among whom? Well, that's among the 10 horns of that fourth beast, right, Penny? Uh, the 10 horns of the fourth beast. And so that fourth beast, which is Rome, then is going to give rise to 10 kingdoms, which we saw already. That was the Alamanni, the Franks, the Burgundians, the Suevi, the Anglo-Saxons, the Visigoths, Lombards, Herdli, Vandals, Ostrogoths, and so on. And, uh, and from those four kingdoms, there, from amongst these 10 kingdoms, I should say, another one is going to rise. So one of the first characteristics of the little horn is that the little horn comes up after the Roman Empire during the time of its 10 divisions, right? The 10 divisions that come afterwards, it has to come up at this time. There are some that come along and interpret uh, these prophecies to include or to, to say that this might be somebody who came back during the Greek uh, time, during the third beast. But it's very clear that this comes up after the fourth beast. It's a horn on the fourth beast, not after the third or anything other than that. And it comes among the 10. And so it must come up at a time when there are the 10 and it will displace, again, three of them. So it has to be there before AD 493. And uh, it's got to be involved in the displacement of the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Okay. So that would be our point number two. And again, we have all of these uh, individuals. And so the second uh, point that we want to look at, oh, sorry is that uh, before, it says in Daniel 7 and verse 8, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So the little horn 
it plucks up by the roots three of the other horns. What does it mean to pluck up by the roots? It means that those three kingdoms or kings are completely destroyed. And there's no trace, there's nothing remaining of those, that kingdom or that king or that power. So the little horn, the second point is that the little horn destroys three of the kingdoms that rise out of Rome. And again, when we look at that, we see that that is the Heruli, that is the Vandals, and that is the Ostrogoths. And they happened here at 493, 534, and 538. So that's another characteristic. So it comes up during the time of the Ten Horns after uh, Rome's predominant power, and it displaces three of those horns. Right? Now it says that it has eyes like the eyes of a man. So it, this power has a man that is leading it. Right? That's the head of it is a man that is leading it. And in a particular way, this power has foresight and insight. And it carefully lays plans for far in advance. So this power, this little horn has a man as its head and it clearly lays and carefully lays plans far in advance. Right. And uh, also in verse eight, it says, and it has a mouth speaking great things. And in verse 25, it says its mouth would speak great words against the most high. Right. So be speaking great words against the most high. Now, again, revelation is, it goes over all of these prophecies and then expands even further. So we're going to find the, the same power or the same uh, system or the same individual or the same king or kingdom in, in Revelation, and we're going to find it in Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to find the similarities right there. Revel keep your finger in Daniel chapter 7 because we'll be coming back to that. But in Revelation 13, and in verses five and six, we see something that is very familiar from what we are reading right now. Uh, who would like to read Revelation 13, verses five and six? All right, Nora, I mean, Portia. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Mm -hmm. So still, same thing. It's given him a mouth speaking great things. So we just heard about speaking great things, right? Um, and, uh, and now it specifies a little bit more in Revelation what those great things, it's blasphemy, right? So it would speak blasphemies against God. It would blaspheme his name, blaspheme his tabernacle, and blaspheme them that live in heaven. So that's quite interesting. And what is it for a horn, a king or a kingdom to speak? Well, let's look at Revelation 13 and verse 11. So same chapter, just a few verses down in verse 11. Revelation 13 and verse 11. Who would like to read that? All right, Marilyn. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Mm -hmm. So here's another beast, right? It's not the first one. It's not the same as what we're talking about. It's another one. And uh, this beast, interestingly enough, comes out of the earth. So it means it's coming out of an unpopulated region. If it came out of the sea, then it would be a populated region. And we'll see, we would see if we went earlier in Revelation chapter 13, that first beast does come out of the sea. Um, and, uh, and it, it has, uh, two horns like a lamb. So it seems innocent, but it speaks as a dragon. Now, 
how is it that a king speaks and how would it speak like a dragon or how would a bee speak like a dragon? It has to do with enforcement. It has to do with enforcement. So the little horn will make and enforce legislation that is against God, that blasphemes his name, his tabernacle, and the heavenly host. So that's what it, that's another condition that's going to that's going to say, okay, well, this is this power. This is the little horn. Right? It's going to enforce legislation. It's going to make the legislation, and then it's going to look at enforcing it against God, blaspheming his name, his tabernacle, and the heavenly host. Right? Now, when we go down to Daniel 7 and verse 25, it says that it shall, it shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This little horn is going to wear out the saints of the Most High. So it's going to be a persecuting power. And it's going to be a persecuting power against God's people. And apparently it's going to continue that persecution for a long time because it's going to seek to wear out the saints of the most high. And that may take a while. So the fifth point is that the little horn will persecute God's people <clears throat> and it'll do so for a long time, not an indefinite time, but for a long time. Uh, because in Revelation 13, when we read about that first beast, it says it was given into his mouth, uh, and this is verse uh, Revelation 13 and verse 5 and 6, it says there was given into his mouth, uh, him a mouth speaking great uh, things of blasphemies, and power was given unto him to, to continue 40 and 2 months. We're going we're gonna to look at that, 40 and 2 months, 42 months. It correlates with something else that we've already read in Daniel chapter 7. And we're going we're gonna to outline that here. And another characteristic, we'll get to it, is that it will think to change times and laws. Now, as far as laws is concerned, some translations say the law. It thinks to change times and the law. And so this little horn will attempt to change God's law and God's time. And we're going to look at that more in detail later. We don't have time to get into that tonight, but we'll continue with that next week. And then <clears throat> when it comes to, will be given into their hands. Now it says that they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. So what is that? Well, the word for time and time and times is it on. And it's a Chaldean word. And it means a year, it means a year, a time. So <clears throat> they were given a time, a year, times, plural, two years, and a dividing of time, which means half of the time. So we've got a time, which is one year, times, which is two years, and a half uh, or a dividing of time. So that gives us one, two, three and a half years. Right. So let's look at this. Uh, what did the Jewish, this is, this is Daniel writing, and he's, he's writing in the Jewish context. And so what did the Jewish year look like? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 7. We're going to see what a Jewish year looked like in Genesis chapter 7. Uh, God's year was like. And, and uh, there in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11, so it says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, the 17th day of the month. All right, so this is the 17th day of the second month. The same day where all the fountains of the deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So this is the flood. So the beginning of the flood is when Noah is 600 years old, and it's the 17th day of the second month. Then in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4, it says the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So here you have it resting the 17th day of the seventh month. So the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month is five months exactly. Right? So you have exactly five months. Now, when we look at Genesis 7 and verse 24, it says the waters prevailed upon the earth. 150 days. And in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 3, it says the waters return from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. So it was how many months? It was 
from the 17th day of the second to the 17th day of the seventh. So you have five months. And here it was 150 days. So five months equals 150 days. So a month is equal to 30 days. And indeed, this is very consistent with the Jewish calendar because the Jewish calendar consisted of 12 to 13 months, each consisting of 30 days. What do I mean 12 to 13? Isn't a year with 12 months? Well, yes. A typical Jewish year was 12 times 30 days or 360 days. But a solar year, the time that it takes for the earth to, to go completely around the, the sun and come back is 365.25 days. That's not 360 days. So when it comes to a solar year and the earth going all the way around the sun and coming back, that takes a little bit longer than the Jewish year and indeed about 5.25 days longer. And so every year, the Jewish calendar would get ahead of the solar calendar. You can imagine that, uh, that you know, every year, if the, if the solar year is coming back around here and the Jewish calendar is getting back around to its year of five days, a little bit more ahead, then your month, if it, your, let's say, for instance, it's the first month of the year, was here lined up with the solar calendar. And then as the solar calendar goes around, the, the Jewish calendar gets back to its head about five days or so before the, the solar calendar. And then it keeps going around like that and it comes back around and the Jewish calendar gets ahead a little bit more from the solar calendar. And as each revolution comes, it gets a little bit farther ahead and a little bit farther ahead and so on. So every year, the Jewish calendar gets farther and farther ahead of the solar calendar, which means that it gets earlier and earlier in the year. So first of March would be, you know, late winter, early spring. Um, but then next year on the Jewish calendar, first of March would be a little bit more in the winter. And then the first of March would be a little bit more in the winter. And then each year it'd get ahead and get ahead. And eventually March would be midwinter. And then if it kept going, March would be fall time. And then March would be summertime. And then March would eventually get back to uh, winter. So it'd be a bit chaotic from that standpoint. So periodically what they did in the Jewish calendar is they just added an extra month. And that happened seven times in 19 years. So every 19 years, they had seven extra months that were added, a 13th month that was added to the calendar. And this was added so that the Passover could always happen after the beginning of the barley harvest. So you can imagine the Passover is stuck on the Jewish calendar. And the solar calendar is coming along. So the Jewish calendar gets earlier and earlier. And let's say the barley harvest happened. The barley, it was planted over winter, it grew over winter. And so the harvest was in the spring. And so, so let's say that, the, that the, um, the, with the Jewish calendar, Passover was, you know, just a little bit after the barley harvest. Well, now it becomes five days earlier, and then it becomes five days earlier, and then it gets five days earlier. And then pretty soon, if you kept going, well, the Passover would be, for, be before the barley harvest. And so they had had to af, add an extra month to push it back past the barley harvest and so on. And as it got close to the barley harvest, then they would add another month to the year in order to push uh, Passover again past the beginning of the barley harvest so that they could have a wave sheaf offering and so on uh, at that time. So that's how the Jews handle the, handle the typical year. And so a time... In, uh, in was a day, a time was a day, but in prophecy, a time equals a year, which is 360 days, right? And I mean, I mean a time was a year, which, it, sorry, a time was a year, and in, which represents 360 days. And it's told in Daniel 7.25 that they shall be given into his hand until a time of times and the dividing of time. So a time is a year, which is 12 months or 360 days. Times are two years or 24 months or 720 days. And a dividing of time is a half a year, six months and 180 days. So in total, you have a three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 days. 
Hmm. 42 months. Hang on. Didn't we read something about that? I think we were in Revelation, Revelation 13. Uh, and uh, so we have a time times and dividing of time. So three and a half years or 1260 days that is given to this beast in Daniel 7 and verse 25. And in Revelation 13 and verse five, it says there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Oh, look, 40 and two months is the very same thing as a time times and dividing the times, which is the very same thing as 1260 days. Now, in prophecy, prophetically, there are uh, some things that we need to understand about time is that prophetically, many times time is, re is, is uh, given a day for a year. So let's look at Numbers 14. Numbers 14, let's go there in our Bibles, number four, Numbers 14. And here in Numbers 14, what has happened is Israel has come up to the borders of the Promised Land. And they have sent out spies, one from each tribe. And uh, the spies have spied out the land and they have come back. And 10 of the spies have given a bad report. They said, oh, it's, they've got giants. Look at this big cluster of grapes. It's got wonderful food and all this kind of stuff. But you know what, the giants are so big. They are going to kill us, and there's no way that we can take it. We're grasshoppers in their sight, and, and the land, is, and then they started lying. The land is so bad that it destroys its inhabitants. It eats up its inhabitants. But how does it eat up its inhabitants if it produces such a big cluster of grapes, and it, and it you know, grows giants and all that kind of stuff? It was just... Anyways, and then all of Israel started complaining and wailing and, and crying, and, oh, no, we can't do it, and we're not going to, and, oh, what God, we have died in the wilderness, and 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 so on and so you know god couldn't let them go into the promised land because now they were not believing in him they, they didn't have faith in him and the only way that they could conquer the enemy is by faith and now there was no faith it was all doubt and they were they were rebellious in their doubting and so god said okay you wanted to die in the wilderness you get to die in the wilderness go back to the wilderness now it wasn't god slapping them around because he was frustrated at them um it was god protecting them by sending them back out in the wilderness because if they would have gone into Canaan they would have killed them I mean the Canaanites would have killed the the Israelites because I mean they were small they weren't that you know they weren't warriors it was only by God's protection and so he's looking to protect them and so he says something very interesting here numbers 14 33 and 34 he wants to read that All right, Ricardo. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and be your wardens until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall he bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and he shall know my breach of my promise. Yes. So here, they're going to go back into the wilderness 40 years. Why 40 years? Because they spent 40 days spying the land. So a, a year for a day, a year for a day. Now, that is in relation to an occurrence and what's going to happen because of that occurrence. But here, we're going to look at something prophetic. We're going to look at Ezekiel 4. So we'll go to Ezekiel. And we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 4. And uh, here Ezekiel has been, I, I would not have wanted to be Ezekiel um, or Jeremiah or actually a number of the other prophets because they had really interesting things that they had to do. So here in Ezekiel chapter four, Ezekiel is given a, a mission and uh, he's, he's supposed to do something to represent something. So this is going to be a prophecy, but he's a living example of prophecy. And I'm going to read the verses uh, one through three, and then somebody else can pick up at verses four through six. It says, thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So he's, gonna, he's going to draw Jerusalem on this tile and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and then cast a mount against it, set up camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. So he's going to make like a, 
toy depiction of Jerusalem on a tile, and then make build all this stuff and make it round about it. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city and set thy face against it and it shall be besieged and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel, All right? So this is gonna be a prophecy. And now let's go on. Who, who wants to read verses four through six? Okay. All right, Marlon. Lie thou also upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Mm. Now, I would not want to be... Ezekiel, because now he's going to have to lie on his left side for 390 days. That's well over a year. And then once he's done with that, he lies on his right side for 40 days. And he's appointed to each the, a day for a year. So for every year of apostasy, Israel had lots and lots of apostasy. Now, Judah did better than Israel for quite a while, but then went off into apostasy as well. And so he's going to bear the sins of Israel for every year of their apostasy, 390 years, and 40 years of apostasy from Judah. And he's going to lie on one side for one, one side for the other. So you see this principle of a day for a year or a year for a day. And they shall be given into his hand a time times and a dividing of time. So the literal, the, the little horn is going to remain in power for three and a half prophetic years or 42 prophetic months or 1260 prophetic days, which actually, since it's a day for a year, is actually 1260 actual years. So it's going to remain for 1260 years. And taking the destruction of the Ostrogoths in 8538 as the beginning of the reign of this little horn, because it has removed its opposing powers out of the way. Now it is a, it is a power. And taking 1260 years as the length of the reign of that little horn, that means that the little horn's reign will come to 1798. So that's 538 plus 1260 gives you 1798. So it's going to reign until 1798. So in summary, this little horn comes up after the Roman Empire during the time of its 10 divisions. It destroys three of the kingdoms that arise out of Rome. It has a man as its head and carefully lays plans far in advance. It makes and enforces legislation that is against God and his name and his sanctuary, his tabernacle and uh, the hosts of heaven. It persecutes God's people for a long time. Uh, how long? For 1260 years. Uh, it will attempt to change God's law and God's time, and it will remain in power for 1260 years. There is only one power. There is only one system that fits this description all seven of these criteria there is you can't fit it anywhere else it only fits in one description and what is that if you know don't say anything because we're going to come to this next week and we're going to pick up and we're going to look at more criteria and we're going to look more at daniel 7 so that we can continue honing in on this and have a very definitive diagnosis of who the great rebel is that's leading this and uh, more of the nefarious plans that are behind it, because we are going to see that the issues that we are dealing with now, climate change, response to climate change, um, the, the whole responses to the COVID, the coming of this idea of a new world order and other things of nature of this nature and so on are going to be associated with this little horn and with this little power. Now, yes, it shows that it was, uh, its power was gonna be taken away in 1798, but we'll see some things from Revelation that shows that it will come back 
and uh, it will come back with a vengeance for a while. But remember the prophecy from the statue of Daniel chapter two, there's 10 toes. And in the time of those 10 to toes, a stone is cut out and that stone will come and it will crush the image in the time of the toes. And it will destroy all of that image and everything before it. And then it will grow up to be a large mountain that will never be removed because it will be the mount or the kingdom of God. So eventually God's kingdom is going to prevail, but we're getting more and more details as we get deeper into the prophecy to understand which powers are involved in what, what's behind all of this stuff. And we are going to go there next time. We're gonna get deeper. But right now, let's pray and uh, ask the Lord's blessing on this coming week. And we will come back together again next week and continue our study from here. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome God you are. Such an awesome God. We thank you that you are in control, that you have seen all things, that you have given us prophecy in which we can look at these things and we can understand what's going on and what's behind it all. And we pray this, thanking you for doing so. Draw us close to you. We ask for you to be with those who are sick and uh, hurting at this time. There are quite a few that I know of that have come down with this prevailing illness at this time and are struggling, whether in a hospital or at home. And uh, we just ask for your blessing upon all and work out your perfect will and way. Draw us close to you and prepare us for these interesting times that we are in and that will come that we might stand for you and be taken home to heaven to be with you forever, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, thank you. God bless. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with the microphones because uh, a couple of you, it just wasn't working and I'm not sure what's up with that. But uh, Pleasure. We will see you next week. And uh, we should be pretty regular from now on uh, as far as Bible studies, because most of the travel is over with. All right. Good night. God bless. God bless. Good night.